Idaho Falls Pediatrics, proud of you supporting kids in our community and 7 Questions with Emmy. Hey guys, welcome back to 7 Questions with Emmy. Today I'm excited to be chatting with Ginger Z, the Chief Meteorologist at ABC News. You can see Ginger every day on Good Morning America, and she's traveled the country reporting the weather. Ginger, it's so great to see you today. It is wonderful to be here. I am honored. Question number one. How did you always want to be a meteorologist? From eight years old on, I grew up in Michigan. I was born in California, but I grew up in Michigan. And one summer, I got to spend the entire summer on the lake. And I got to see storms, thunderstorms regularly coming across. And I remember looking far in the distance. And then sometimes the rain would make it to us. Sometimes it would be big wind. Sometimes nothing would happen. It would look the same at the beginning. And I thought, well, this is a puzzle that I would like to put together. And that summer, I also saw water spouts, which are like tornadoes on the water. And instead of being fearful, I found myself ultimately curious. And that curiosity then took me to third grade. And I remember that first day of third grade running to the set of encyclopedia, which I don't know if you know what that is, but encyclopedia is like Google, but a bunch of books. And I would run to the weather part and grab the tornado section or the hurricane section. And I became, I would say, obsessed with figuring out that puzzle that is the atmosphere. You've reported in a lot of extreme weather conditions. What's the craziest thing you've covered? I've actually been in one in New York where the big flood happened. You were. So you got the. I was there visiting Drew Barrymore and I got the full New York experience because it was my first time in New York. No way. So you got to experience the remnants of Ida combined with that cold front, which. I don't know if you saw, but 24 hours, the National Weather Service and meteorologists all over were saying life-threatening flooding and catastrophic damage. And that's the unfortunate thing is when we know the forecast is going to come true and then it verifies. We don't like seeing that, but unfortunately, it does happen. So for me, the most uh, dangerous or the probably the most memorable is Hurricane Katrina. And I went to cover Hurricane Katrina from Gulfport because Gulfport, Mississippi and the Mississippi coast was actually where the worst of the storm happened. What happened in New Orleans and Katrina was an engineering failure. And it was a breached levee and it was happened hours after the storm because they were actually on the backside of the storm. So I was in Gulfport, Mississippi, and it was... Wow, it was one of the scariest uh, to see the impact to humans. And that's really one of my points in my career where my storm chasing and my science brain changed from my passion for the atmosphere to compassion because storms are just as much and more about people than they are about the science. Sometimes it's hard for me to wake up early for school. You have to wake up super early for GMA. Any tips you can share? Get a couple of dogs that wake you up early. No, I'm kidding. That's what my mine. dad won't let me get a dog. Oh, well, I guess this is the reason. You know what? If Femi's got to take care of the dog, she'll wake up early because it'll wake her up. Just get my kind of dogs that'll wake you up. Um, I am very serious about bedtime. Sometimes I even go to bed before my children. <laughs> How old are your kids? Three and five. I, I say to them, good luck. No, usually their dad takes them to bed if they want to watch a little something and it's past 8.30. <laughs> what are your favorite things about being a mom? My favorite thing is watching them discover the world and being able to try to do my very best to help guide them into it. It's taken me 40 years to try to figure out a lot of this. I hope to impart a little bit of the wisdom that I've come away with a little earlier in their lives. Can you share an embarrassing moment that you've had on TV? Which one? I've got so many. I've got them all throughout. The, <laughs> like uh, the most embarrassing one that you ever had. The most embarrassing is probably I was I was when I worked in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is my hometown. I was one of six meteorologists. So they said, well, on certain days, we're going to have you do regular reporting. And so I was out on a college campus doing a story about um, a, a fight, I don't, it was like a fight that had broken out and a bunch of people had gotten hurt. And it was a very, you know, not, not a meteorology story. Um, but here I was telling a live story and a man went streaking behind me, meaning that he did not have any clothing on <laughs> and I didn't realize he didn't. And 
that is not something this is this is the wild part this is well before the internet he couldn't have known how well timed it was so much so that i heard him screaming from behind me and i and the story i was telling had i said a cat call and then i said much like that and if you freeze the video the man is basically standing on my hand <laughs> and he does he has a sombrero and tennis shoes and not much else going on <laughs> and the best part of me is that years later after i was working at abc i went to the auto show in detroit and that man came up, he waited in the line to meet me and he said, hi, I'm your streaker. And I said, what? And he had a, a family, he had a baby and a wife and he was just, we were all laughing very hard. It was, you know, he was just a young man having a great time that evening. <laughs> but that was an embarrassing moment because I didn't know until he ran past me. And then my eyes, you could see in the video go, oh my goodness. And <laughs> I think they just took to my, to my story right there. Sometimes people say mean things online or when they see you on TV. How do you handle the nasty comments? Mm, the nasty comments are inevitable. And I think I've become almost expert level at understanding, and it has helped me in my real life too, at understanding that everyone's going to have an opinion and I'm not gonna be the cup of tea of everybody and that that's okay. If we were all the cup of tea for everybody, it wouldn't work. You know, our, our life is all about being unique and different. And there are people who I, you know, see in a movie or I watch on something and I'm, they may not be my cup of tea. Now, granted, I'm not going to write them a tweet and say that I don't like them. So that's the difference. But I can understand that someone's expressing their opinion. A lot of times it comes from pain. So I have great empathy for them or I find them highly entertaining. I kind of love when they come at me and, and I can use them for an educational purpose too, because a lot of times it's something that maybe other people are thinking, but they're not saying. And once in a great while, I take the constructive criticism if it is real. It's taken me a long time to get to this place. And something I always try to tell anybody that's online that has social media is that everybody has fans in real life. It's called your friends your family, and the folks online are just another extension of that, but they're not everything. They're very little, actually. And um, I, I often go at it with the thought of, oh, I hope they're not hurting, you know? <laughs> How hard is it to predict the weather? <laughs> The prediction of weather and weather forecasting has come so far, even in the 20 years that I've been doing it. So our science keeps growing, just like every science. That's the beauty of science is that it is a journey. It is not something where we're at this destination and we say, yep, that's the end of it. In most cases, gravity, we're pretty sure of things like that. But there are always things to be learned. And that's part of why I love it. Now, in saying that, when you talk and people love the joke or they say, oh, it must be nice to get paid and get, you know, to be half of your life be wrong. That's just not true. If you go and you do the actual verified numbers of how meteorologists have the ability to forecast, we're not your regular weather app on a phone. If you go to a forecast from a human being who knows what they're doing three days out, we're pretty good. We're pretty up there in that 80 to 100 percent category. And so when it goes past three days, there's one part that's missing. One of the main ingredients to making a forecast is observation. And if you think about where most of our weather comes from, say in the United States here, it's from west to east. What's west of California? Water. Water, a lot of it. So we don't have land-based or weather balloon observations. All we have is a picture from the top, from the satellite. So we're missing two ingredients actually to making a really detailed forecast. If we were able to put observations all over the Pacific Ocean, then between Japan and California, we'd have a much better profile of what's happening. When and if we do that, we are going to have the ability to forecast precipitation, especially on a much broader scale. You'll notice temperature, if you, even if you look at your app, which I don't like to promote that because I don't use any, I just forecast for myself. But even if you look temperature, we can go 10 days out and get a pretty good idea of what the trend of temperature will be. But when it comes to precipitation, we still have a lot of room to grow beyond three days. Now it's time for some bonus questions. Are you ready, Ginger? I'm ready. Question number one, how does wind form? Wind is just a difference. I mean, think about how our earth heats and cools. So we've got cool poles and a very warm equator, right? So it's not equal how it heats. That difference in temperature is called a temperature gradient. And that's the main reason that we have weather movement or therefore wind. There's a lot of other things that can create wind, but that's the main one. <laughs> Have you ever been to Idaho and tried our famous potatoes? Do you know that I've only 
have two states on my list that I need to yet get to, and Idaho is one of them, Oregon is the other. So I have not been there, but I've certainly tasted your potatoes and they're wonderful. When you come to Idaho, you're gonna have to try uh, some of our potatoes and you can come with me. Like, that sounds like a great plan. Potatoes together. You know what we need to do because a lot of my reporting now is all focused on climate change and agriculture. I did a whole show called Food Forecast. And so potatoes are one of those that are pretty easily grown in a lot of different places, but not as well. So I bet you there's something specific that's changing in the seasonality of potatoes. If I spoke to the potato farmers that we could find an angle to get me there. I feel like we could. Yeah. <laughs> And I know a potato farmer. So we well, let's work on it. Get you in. <laughs> <laughs> can you share something with me uh, that you've learned that may help me in my life? I think the easiest and the best one that I can think of that I hope you could take away and everybody could take away is most of the things that we are worried about on every single day of our lives don't really matter. And that sounds terrible to say, but we can really work ourselves up into a tornado ourselves, right? You can get yourself all frustrated or angry and emotion is wonderful and it's a, a wonderful to share and feel. But at a certain point, I like to ask myself, will I remember this or will this matter a year from now? And if that answer is no, I let go. And I say, okay, time to move on with my energy because there's no point. And let me tell you, as I get older, I remember less and less. So it takes a lot for me to say yes to that question. So I think if I could go back and if I could be your age, I was so worried all the time. I was always worried about school. I was always worried about life is beautiful. Take in all of the good, the bad. And, and something I tell my five-year-old son that I, it took me a long time. And I think I'm just starting to learn by watching him. I always wanted perfection, always. And that's, we hear it all the time. Nobody's perfect. Miley Cyrus wrote a song about it, Hannah Montana, right? But perfection, I always tell him is on this side and like really evil bad is on this side. All of us live between. It's wonderful to be on that other half most of the time, but we're going to fluctuate. We're going to have bad choices. We're going to have, and giving yourself grace is the other thing that throughout the whole thing, you just do your absolute best. And that's all we can do. And then move on because you probably won't remember it anyway. <laughs> Thanks so much for talking with me today, Ginger. Thank you, Emmy. I'll see you in the potato farms. Yeah. Don't forget, I post a new seven questions interview every Thursday, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and our Meet in the E and Z YouTube channel. Ginger, thanks so much for chatting with me. I wish you a week full of Sunday, sunny days. Thank you, and sunshine to you as well. Idaho Falls Pediatrics, proud of you supporting kids in our community and seven questions with Emmy.